good evening and welcome to our the first of our rural support and wellbeing webinars this one is aimed uh, at farm and vehicle safety this evening it seems to be the topic um i uh this is the one of many that we're going to do across the winter months um and they've all been organized via um the trading standards team as part of the Future Farm Resilience Programme. Our guest speakers tonight are James Warner from the Devon and, Fire, Devon and Somerset Fire and Rescue and Ross Breeley from Devon County Council's Race Safety Team. Um, I think we've just got a bit of housekeeping that we need to do and then we can crack on with our first speakers. Um, thank you for joining us um, and I just have to point out that obviously the recording will be being uh, the, the evening will be recorded tonight um, so if you could just keep your cameras and your microphones muted but if you do have any questions please use the chat function um, I think you can actually unmute yourself so uh, there's only a few of us online this evening so please feel free to pip in at any point I know the speakers are quite happy to engage with us throughout the evening um, and answer any questions that you have um, if you need some guidance on how to use the um, the facilities, then please, there's, there's a mic button and you just need to click on it um, and you should be able to speak to us. But there's also a chat function where you can ask a question and if you need any guidance, we can help you with that. OK, thanks, Sam. Next slide. Um, there is a disclaimer and this webinar is being recorded to enable clients to watch this webinar after the session has been completed. Your webcam has been disabled for tonight. You can share your questions tonight by unmuting yourself, as I've said, or via the chat. If you pref would prefer, you can um, uh, your name not to be shared in the presentation. Please let us know and uh, we can obviously get that removed. The contact details there are for Luke Groves Davis, his email address or his uh, contact number. OK, so if we crack straight on, um, I'd like to introduce James and Ross. They're going to do a bit of a double act this evening. Uh, and um, yeah, if you'd like to share your slides and um, uh, we'll, we'll get on with the presentations. Thank you. Right, good evening everybody. My name's James. I am one of the road safety officers for Devon and Somerset Fire and Rescue Service and I'm joined this evening by Ross. Good evening everyone. Um, thank you for attending tonight. Uh, yeah, I, my name's Ross Brady. I work for Devon County Council and the road safety team um, and me and James work collaboratively on a lot of projects throughout the region um, spreading the work of road safety. So this evening we're just Talking, it, I know obviously I work for the fire service, so you may have been expecting a, a talk on agricultural fires, but uh, tonight we are talking about road safety. Um, so we shall make a start. So the reason why we work in road safety, as you can see, so Vision Zero, hopefully you can all see this, uh, my screen at the minute under Vision Zero. Vision Zero, for those that haven't heard of, is a partnership in the southwest made up of local authorities, councils, uh, Devon and Cornwall Police, Devon and Somerset Fire and Rescue Service, Cornwall Fire Service, uh, the Ambulance Service SWAST and Devon Air Ambulance, all with the vision of reducing road uh, KSIs, which is killed or seriously injured in road traffic collisions. So the reason why we're doing it today, in 2022, as we can see, 3,799 casualties recorded by the police in 2022, unfortunately. Um, just below that, as we can see from the chart, 58% were in rural locations. Uh, so the rural community, especially the farming community, uh, is unfortunately more at risk. So we're trying to work together with local agencies and support staff to try and help and raise awareness. And hopefully this will be one of the evenings where we can do that. So other data that we can see, our highest risk group on the roads is 16 to 24 year olds. So for us in the southwest, young drivers are of the highest risk group, unfortunately. So we spend a lot of time trying to engage with young drivers. So at the minute I'm working with Devon Young Farmers, trying to engage with all the different Devon Young Farmer clubs at the moment. So next slide. So this is one from Ross uh, showing between 2018 and 2022, fatal collisions on our roads, unfortunately. Yeah, just to um, 
like I said, each red star represents a fatality on our road network. Um, I'm not able to zoom in far enough to get you the full peninsula, but you can see that there's obviously far too many there. So um, part of the vision zero or their vision is obviously to reduce the numbers by 2030 and, and more substantially by 2040. So uh, working closely at the moment across a, a whole plethora of thematic groups, um, young drivers, older drivers, business drivers, um, motorcyclists, cyclists and pedestrians just trying to reduce the numbers because um, as you can see if you look at this everyone represents a life and it's just unfortunately it happens far too often. So what do you think contributes to road traffic collisions and injuries? So police, fire, ambulance and air ambulance we have a phrase called the fatal five. Uh, the fatal five is basically the top five causes of a road traffic collision and also the top cause of injury at a road traffic collision. Those are driving under the influence of drink or drugs, speeding, not wearing a seatbelt, mobile phones. So mobile phones, so we've got distractions down there, but mobile phones is the biggest distraction and it is one of the top five causes of all car crashes. Uh, and finally, tiredness. But driving under influence, speeding, not wearing a seatbelt, mobile phones and tiredness, those are the top five causes of a car crash and causes of injury at a car crash, unfortunately. So uh, personally, if I go to a road traffic collision, at least one of those isn't a contributing factor to that road traffic collision and it's quite a rare a rare traffic collision um all of these human error aren't they unfortunately or human factors at least okay they're all preventable let's be honest um i think the latest stat is only two percent of all road traffic collisions like is caused by mechanical failure so 98 percent of all road traffic collisions is down to some sort of human input unfortunately um it's far too high so what we're going to do this evening is we're just going to look at each one of the fatal five and just talk a little bit more about about it uh the dangers uh and how to prevent it and some of the legalities around it uh, if you have any questions at any point please obviously feel free to type in the chat and myself and ross will do our best to answer the questions so mobile phones let's start with hopefully you can all hear the sound um you hear the sound? Thumbs up. No, I can't hear the sound. Well, someone's got sound. someone can because there's a thumbs up. <laughs> OK. Um, anybody else? Can you put it in chat if you can hear the sound or not? Unfortunately, I can't hear any sound. Let me just stop sharing the screen very quickly and I will see if I can share it again with audio input computer sound. There we go. So now let's have a look from the current slide.
So mobile phone use. You will see a lot of people nowadays are unfortunately glued to their phone, aren't they? Whether they're sat down, walking or unfortunately driving. So when it comes to driving, I guess previously a lot of cars didn't have hands free kits or Bluetooth. So you used to see a lot of people with their phone to their ear. Um, you still see that, but you see less of that because obviously nowadays phones, uh, cars are fitted with hands free or Bluetooth. So has the problem gone? No, unfortunately, it just seems to have evolved and changed. So nowadays, unfortunately, we've seen a lot of people using their phone. Uh, they're texting whilst they're driving or they on so social media, for example, whilst they're driving. Um, which is actually probably more dangerous than having it to your ear because they're looking down and they're not looking at the road at all, unfortunately. So mobile phones is a is a huge distraction. It's the biggest distraction. It's one of the fatal fibers we know. Um, so much so that the police last year, well, the government actually, obviously, uh, changed the law. So the beginning of last year, if you're caught on your phone, it was three points and I think I think a £250 fine. Now it's doubled, so it's six points on your licence and I believe a minimum of a £500 fine. Ross, am I correct on that? Yeah, I think it's actually up to a thousand, James. Um, up and it's to just, a thousand, yeah. ju just worth noting um, that hands free, James has mentioned hands free, and although hands free is a legal option at the moment, if you were to be involved in an incident, an accident, um, it wouldn't be deemed as an accident. You'd actually still come under the offence or fall under the offence of due care and attention. So obviously, although there's that facility and you're technically legal, it is still requiring a lot of your attention span. So if you have a collision in using hands free, um, you would still face some form of enforcement action by the due care and attention. Absolutely. So like, so like Ross said, that you, legally you can use your phone hands free. I know a lot of people use their phones as a sat nav. Legally, you can do that. If you've got your phone secure in a cradle, whether that's attached to the windscreen or the dash, and you've got it using your maps, that's fine. But the minute you start touching your phone, whether you're cancelling a call, answering a call, about to send a text message or change the postcode on your sat nav or whatever, any touching of your phone will result in six points on your license nowadays, unfortunately. So for a new driver, so I spend a lot of my time uh, under the fire service. We engage with a lot of the new drivers and the, uh, young drivers, 16 to 24 year olds, as I previously said, the highest risk group in our in our area. Um, and what I try to explain to them is that as a new driver, they have a probationary license, which is up to six points. So if they get caught on their phone, that's their license gone in, in one hit. Um, and we're sort of trying to explain the consequences and and the issues around mobile phone use and a lot of them don't realize that so yeah for a new driver six points start again you lose your license and you've got to start your test and your theory again so mobile phones is yeah absolutely one of the top five causes of all of all incidents unfortunately of all car crashes and i've just double checked the financial uh fine it falls between 200 and a thousand 200 pounds and a thousand pounds a thousand being the maximum um financial penalty absolutely the uh, vision zero southwest uh the partnership in the southwest uh have been trialing cameras they're not speed cameras they're detection cameras uh and they can detect whether they look into the interior of people's cars they've been strategically placed over the over the couple of counties uh, and they can look into the cars and they search for whether you are wearing a seatbelt and whether you're on your phone uh you may have seen on local media sites and pages and the local news over the last couple of months about these cameras um but yeah new new camera detection that is coming in just to try and just due to the severity of lack of seatbelt use and mobile phone use unfortunately anything to add ross uh, no i think you've got it covered like you said you've mentioned the um the ai trials which have got the capability to look into the the, to the cab into the internal of the vehicle and, and detect these offences so you know six points for one you know glance at your phone having it in your hand is, is a really big penalty especially if you're working uh, you're reliant on your license for your livelihoods which I'm sure many of you are so um, yeah just want to reiterate 100 what Ross said like you rely on your license for your livelihood it's about what I'm trying to explain to me about think about the ripple effect that one 
moment of maybe madness where you wouldn't perhaps normally look at your phone but you did and you pick it up and you get caught you lose your license potentially if you lose your license do you lose your job if you lose your job you've got no income are you then able to live financially like where you live in like you're renting are you owning your own hand like thinking about the ripple effects what you can afford and what you didn't suddenly can't afford if you don't have an income it's about trying to think of the wider the ripple effects we call it but we shall move on to seat belts now so seat belts most people's cars nowadays would beep and flash at you which would be far more annoying than just putting a seat belt on in the first place but unfortunately still a heck of a lot of people don't wear seat belts um the video that i'm just about to show you it will show you four crash dummies in a car the driver and the passenger behind the driver have got their seat belt on the front seat passenger and the passenger behind the front seat passenger have not got their seatbelt on. So please watch the video and see the difference. So there is no sound to this video, FYI, but it's slow motion. Now, a lot of people that I do speak to about seatbelt offences, often the people that don't wear their seatbelts, they're sat in the back and I don't see it as being a big issue. But hopefully, as you can see from this video, it really can be, unfortunately. OK. Ross, anything? Um, yeah, just one thing I want to touch on in seatbelt use. Um, I know it's a little bit difficult across the agricultural sector, um, but looking at some of our stats going back over 10 years, we've had uh, seven fatalities involving agricultural vehicles. Now, it doesn't always mean they're blameworthy, but within that category, um, we've had four rollovers on the network, which technically means that the driver of a tractor, in most cases, have been ejected um, from the cab and actually fatally injured from their own tractor or trailer. So I know it's you know it's it's very difficult when you're when you're on the farm and you're used maybe not to belting up or there's no requirement and I know it changes from class of tractor to uh, age experience tonnage etc. But I would plead with anyone just on on those stats alone four fatalities that could have been avoided just to belt up make that two second conscious decision just to put your belt on. Um, it it literally can save your life. So that that's all I say on that. It is literally a lifesaver, the seatbelt, um, but I still, unfortunately, a heck of a lot of people don't wear them. Um, I know a number of firefighters that have been to a collision uh, where this crash style dummy scenario has actually happened in real life, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, seatbelts are designed to save your life. So instant reaction, isn't it, for most people to wear them and put them on, unfortunately. Still, a lot of people don't. But yeah, a lot of people also don't wear their seatbelt because they... Or the people I speak to said that they, their vehicle was fitted with an airbag. So we'll move over to an airbag quickly now. And I'll explain to you. Uh, so airbags uh, are part of an SRS supplementary restraint system, which means they work in conjunction with seatbelts, not instead of seatbelts. Um, and hopefully here you'll see why. So I've got a slow motion video from another fire and rescue service showing the deployment of the front passenger airbag, which normally is the biggest airbag in the car so slow motion video so i'll just play that one more time if i can please note that this dummy that's the in the in the front passenger seat that dummy that they're using is one of our breathing apparatus casualty dummies that we use for search and rescue training. That is about, they're usually around 70 kilograms. So that is not a light dummy, unfortunately. It is, yeah, 70 kilograms. But um, a lot of people don't wear seatbelts because they say, oh, my car's got airbags, I'll be all right. An airbag deploys from, for example, the front dash, the steering wheel, where um, the curtain airbags, the seats, wherever the airbags are in the car, they deploy at a speed around 
between 195 and 205 miles an hour on average, dependent on the make or model of the car. OK, so they work with seatbelts, not at, not instead of. So if you're involved in a collision and you went hurt into your dash, when that airbag comes out, that's severely going to hurt. OK, they work with seatbelts. So the seatbelt, you know, sometimes when you go to get in the car and you put your seatbelt on and it locks, that's basically the seatbelt pretension saying, I'm working, I'm ready to go, I'm working. So then in the event of a collision, when you lean forwards, that seatbelt locks in place, pulls you back, and the airbag is then meant to just nicely cushion you back into the seat and protect you. But they work together, seatbelts and airbags. And obviously, as you can see, the left-hand picture, um, feet on the dash. Obviously, you just you watched a video of what can happen, okay? I won't go into the gory details of the injuries that can happen, but I'm sure you can all use your imagination, unfortunately. Anything else, Radaros? I was just going to say that picture there, you see this all far too often. If you're tailed back on the A30 heading for Cornwall or wherever you're travelling, uh, it's generally the sort of holiday destinations, but so close to the end of the journey, you get people sprawled out with their feet on the dashboard and it's, yeah, it doesn't end well. Absolutely. So wrong. next next up, we're talking about distractions. So we've spoken about mobile phones. OK, mobile phones is the biggest distraction. Um, but there's plenty of other different distractions that we can have in the car. Um, even our own minds when we're thinking about what we're doing when we're heading, say you're driving down the A38, the A30, the M5 and you're heading down to work somewhere and you're thinking, what am I going to be doing today? What's, what's the plan and stuff like that? Do you know what I mean? So you can suddenly you're suddenly a couple of miles down the road and you've not really paid attention because you've been too busy engrossing your own minds. But there's so many different distractions, eating, drinking, vaping. But have a watch of this video because I thought it was pretty good. To test just how much attention the attention-stealing design of the new Skoda Fabia actually steals, we left one parked on this ordinary road in West London. We wanted to see if its sharp crystalline shapes, bold lines and lower, wider profile would attract the desired level of attention. Will the 17-inch black alloy wheels stop passers-by in their tracks? Will the angular headlights attract the attention of other road users? Will a crowd gather to check out its fresh, sporty look? Well, not quite. But did the attention-stealing design distract you from noticing that the entire street has been changing right before your very eyes? Don't believe us? Have another look. Did you spot the van changing to a taxi? How about the scooter changing to a pair of bicycles? Or the lady holding a pig? let alone the fact that the entire street is now completely different. Didn't think so. So there we have it. Proof that the new Skoda Fabia is truly attention stealing. So first of all, uh, Devon and Somerset Fire and Rescue Service are not in any way sponsored by Skoda. I better put that out there probably. Um, or Devon County I, Council. <laughs> or Devon County Council. Yeah, I just liked the video. I thought it was really good uh really distracting so everyone that i play it to no nobody noticed the gorillas on the roof so i'll play it one more time and see if you notice and when you notice the gorillas to test just how much attention the attention stealing design of the new skoda fabia actually steals we left one parked on this ordinary road in west london we wanted to see if its sharp crystalline shapes bold lines and lower wider profile would attract the desired level of attention Will the 17-inch black alloy wheels stop passers-by in their tracks? Will the angular headlights attract the attention of other road users? Will a crowd gather to check out its fresh, sporty look? Well, not quite. But did the attention-stealing design distract you from noticing that the entire street has been changing right before your very eyes? Don't believe us? Have another look. Did you spot the van changing to a taxi? How about the scooter changing to a pair of bicycles? Or the lady holding a pig? So we get the idea, but normally it raises a, a good debate wherever I'm talking to people, um, people who spotted what and who hasn't spotted what, but distractions come in all different forms. Like we said and been talking about mobile phones is the biggest one, but there are plenty of other ones, isn't there? Eating, drinking, other people in the car, 
okay children in the back seat for example there's plenty of other distractions okay ross anything to add but right, yeah i think you've, you've covered most of them but it is just that you know cursory glance over your shoulder if you know if you've got children in the back if you're towing something behind you've got a, you know what you perceive to be a secure load but you want to check it you know that that momentary lapse can can make a massive difference to how your journey ends up um and you know we all live such busy lives now we're we're, we're sort of conditioned to do numerous things at any given time and cram so much into our days but you know uh, the driving element is probably the most dangerous thing we do and we do it every day without actually thinking about it um, there's lots of things that you'd risk assess and you would think, I don't know if that's safe to do, whether it be a bungee jump, whether you were going to jump, you know, do a jump out of a plane, whether you're going to go on a, a theme park ride. You'd analyse that and you'd you'd weigh up and uh, think about the element of risk. But jumping in a car, we do it every day or a vehicle, any other vehicle. And we just we've just got a little bit um, blasé about things. And we, we tend to try and do too much when we should just be focusing on the road. So it's imperative. Absolutely. So now we'll move into driving under the influence. So driving under the influence, drink, drugs or a combination of both nowadays, unfortunately. Um, so alcohol, we'll talk about alcohol first of all. So now there, legally, there's a legal limit, isn't there? OK, but like Ross said in regards to uh the, 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 what was the other uh, impact what was the other offense where uh oh sorry uh, due care and attention due care and attention beg your pardon yeah absolutely so like ross said previously you can still be charged okay even if you're under the legal limit okay you can be charged with impairment so the legal limit also it's very difficult isn't it alcohol affects people in different ways doesn't it okay so alcohol affects people in different ways on average it takes one hour for every one unit to leave your body but uh, I've, I've worked with devon and cornwall police and even in somerset police on a number of occasions where we've done say for example over new year's eve and new year's day um doing speed ops and uh driving under influence operations as well um more people are caught the next day um, than that night, unfortunately, because people don't realise how long it takes for alcohol to leave their system. OK, so it's really important to understand if you're thinking about driving the next day, you know, how much you've had to drink, how many units and uh, try and work, try and work it out one hour per unit. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to try and work out. So it's, ideally. Zero should be your limit and everyone knows where they are, then isn't it zero? But um driving under the influence of alcohol. So here's a quick video of a different way to get home. Um, Margarita. Napolitano and hold the cake. Now, I'll admit nowadays trying to get away with that sort of thing probably wouldn't work because you've got Deliveroo, Just Eat and they're all on push bikes or mopeds. So you probably wouldn't be able to get away without being caught on the back of their bike. Um, however, there's always a different option. OK, driving home under the influence of drink or drugs or driving anywhere is not an option. OK, I, I appreciate a lot of people that we're speaking to this evening may well live in a rural community okay so the chances of getting caught by the police may be very very slim okay however 
you know, you've got to think about the other consequences. What happens if you you crash a car, you hurt somebody, you hurt yourself, or worse off, you kill somebody, you kill yourself. Think about the consequences again, like I said earlier, about the ripple effect. OK, I appreciate there may not be in the rural community, there may not be as many options as you might do in a town or city, such as a taxis, buses, uh, other public transport, trains to get home. Um, but yeah, it's never an option to drive under the influence. Anything to add, Ross? We well, was going to say we go back, we we go on about the negative side of the mobile phone and not obviously not to use when driving. But the flip side to that is it empowers you to connectivity. There's no excuse not to text that friend and say, can you get collected or, or range travel, book a taxi. Fine. If you do live on a route that's served by a bus route or, you know, you can get timetables up at, the, at your fingertips. So it's not there's no excuses really anymore not to have that information to hand and pre plan your nights out. Um, and I just looking in the chat, I do see there's a comment in 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 the chat. Um, just just question why the message is being taken less seriously now than say 10 years ago. Um, I can't answer that. I just I don't know if it's anything that's ever gone away, really. Um, I think we still see people flouting the law regularly or just thinking um, nothing bad's going to happen to them. And ultimately, at times it does. And James is probably the best person to answer that in terms of you've turned out for a lot more serious and fatal RTCs than, than me. So I think personally speaking, I think the older generation, so our grandparents and our great grandparents, when they went to the pub, you know, they were always said, oh, do you want one for the road? Uh, so I had a very different mentality and a way, diff very different way of life back then. Uh, but now I think the the younger generations that are growing up, they've seen, uh, they've been growing up all the campaigns about drink and drug, uh, drink driving especially. And I know drink driving is really antisocial, and they know not to do it. So growing up with all the campaigns and everything over over the over the years, but the, a lot of the older generation, perhaps like I said, when they went into the bar. They'd had a, the bartender would be like, oh, do you want one for the road? Uh, examples like that. However, the younger generation hopefully know, they've seen all the adverts, they know for what it's very dangerous. However, a lot of the younger generation, moving on, may not think twice to smoking cannabis and getting in a car, unfortunately. Um, cannabis, so drug driver now as we move on. So driving under the influence, like you said, driving under the influence of alcohol, drugs, or a combination of both. OK, so drug driving, for example, cannabis. Um, it's really important to know, obviously, police, they've obviously got the breathalysers and they've obviously got the drug swipes now so they can search at the side of the road whether or not you are on any drugs or alcohol. It's also really quite interesting. I saw this image the other day on another presentation that I was doing and I found it quite interesting. So how long can cannabis be detected in your system? A hair follicle up to 90 days. OK, the hair follicle up to 90 days was the big one that stood out for me. Uh, also, when it comes to drug driving, there is a zero tolerance, as we know. It's like we said about the league. There's a legal limit for alcohol. But when it comes to drug driving, there's a zero tolerance. OK, and it's really important for people to understand whether they do it recreationally or whatever, how long it can stay in your system for, especially when it comes to cannabis. Um, but when we're talking about drug driving, we're also talking about prescribed drugs as well. Medication, medication that. When you're speaking to your doctor, the doctor should, may say, actually, you shouldn't be driving on this medication as it may cause you drowsiness for example so it's really important if you're on uh, prescribed medication as well to check with your doctor whether or not you're you, you can drive under that under that um prescription as well ross anything to add uh, no i don't think so just just to say that you know we've all got the responsibilities check we are fit to drive whether you know we're, we're going to move on to another element but it comes you know tiredness for instance are you actually feeling well in yourself do you know that you've had are you under the influence of anything uh, whether it be prescribed or, or or illicit drug, alcohol. So yeah, it's um, yeah, there is no defence for it. Absolutely. So there isn't a slide on tiredness, but as we as Ross just brought it up quickly now. So tiredness, again, another one of the fatal five. So tiredness, I think probably everybody's been guilty of driving tired at one at one point, haven't they? Unfortunately. Um, 
tiredness, fatigue, driving whilst fatigued or tired, especially in the rural community. You know, you're working long hours, you're working really, really early starts, potential on the farm. You may have a few really busy days because you've only got a few days of sunshine and it's been really bad weather and you haven't been able to get what you wanted done. So you're having to work really hard on a certain couple of days and, and keep pushing. But driving whilst tired, please don't rule out the severity of driving whilst tired. We've all been guilty of that micro sleep as well. A micro sleep, for example, when you're sat down on the sofa watching TV and you feel your head just nodding down and as it hits your chest or as you look down, you sort of it wakes you back up again, isn't it? A micro sleep, a split second nodding off basically is a micro sleep. Um, but yeah, people know drink, people probably overlook driving whilst tired, unfortunately, but they, everyone knows speeding drug driving drink driving is wrong mobile phones is wrong but people always i think overlook tiredness unfortunately um and actually tiredness um road traffic collisions that i've been to and that our fire service have been to where the cause has been tiredness the actual collision can be a lot more severe um and mainly down to whether you're awake you'll hopefully take some sort of evasive action if you see a hazard or a danger in front of you, whether that's braking, swerving, swerving and braking. But if you fall asleep at the wheel, unfortunately, you don't know there's hazard or danger in front of you and you go straight full pelt into whatever it is, unfortunately. So the so the instance that we attend where the casualty has fallen asleep can be a lot more severe. Also, a telltale sign sometimes that there's no tyre marks on the road as well to show that they've not taken any evasive action either. Um, but yeah, please don't rule out tiredness, okay, at any time of the any time of the year. Ross, anything to add? I would, uh, we we appreciate, especially in the agricultural sector, that it's uh, it's a relentless livelihood. Um, burning the candle at both ends, grafting, you know, into the small hours. Um, but self care is the best care in terms of you know, I appreciate go through seasons, lambing season, for instance, calving season, where, you know, you're going to be up all hours of the night, getting broken sleep night after night after night. And it's just about managing that and seeing if, you know, can you share the burden? Can someone do that trip for you? Can, you know, can someone else drive for you just in case, you know, you do get to that stage where you you are burning yourself out and, um, and just stop, you know, and prevent something, you know, sinister from happening. It's just, it's just spreading the awareness and it does happen and i hear i hear it all too often i'll be fine drove, driving that road i know it like the back of my hand but it doesn't it doesn't stop bad things happening when your fatigue and tiredness is a bi, it's a biological um, reaction in the it's nothing you can prevent it's, if you're that tired you will fall asleep absolutely i know that a lot of people think oh i'll have a cup of coffee or i'll have an energy drink um but what's important to know is that over several hours, if you ha keep on having cups of coffee or energy drinks, any drink, energy drinks and cups of coffee, each one that you have has less of an effect. OK, so each one that you've had will have less of an effect than the previous one as your body sort of adjusts to, to that energy drink and that caffeine. So it's really important that oh, a quick coffee or a quick Red Bull, that'll keep me going. Not always the case. OK, it's really important to understand that. Yeah, and they even have less of an effect even a quick nap, some exercise, a bit of fresh air. They're only short term solutions. If you get to that stage where you are starting to feel that tired, then the only thing really is to try and get yourself safely, you know, pull over and either get someone to get you home and get a proper night's sleep. So. Absolutely. Uh, Ross, are you OK to talk about Tilly Pass, please? Yeah, I just wanted to mention this. This uh, the Tilly Pass scheme is a scheme that's been uh, devised in the southeast of the country. Um, the lady that's um, led this campaign or, or, or come up with this campaign, unfortunately, um, lost her son in a tragic incident. And that was her reasoning for trying to uh, promote safety, um, specifically around uh, trailer towing and uh, maintenance on agricultural vehicles. So um, I think if you can see on the screen, I don't think this is going to transfer, unfortunately, but this is information that can get out to people because I know uh, Jane at Tilly Pass would be really pleased to be spreading the word on this. Um, so Tilly Pass, it's an 18 point check of trailers that's carried out by an independent uh, mechanic, um, which will come to the farm or you can go to them, I believe, but they they can come to your farm and inspect your trailers 
uh, against this 18 point checklist annually just to check they are fit to be on the road. Um, obviously, make sure it keeps you legal. Um, there are a lot of probably unknown uh, enforcement actions from the health and safety executive. So um, you can get yourself into big uh, hot water if uh, vehicles or machinery that you're driving isn't up to spec and the worst does happen. Um, so it's, it's like I said, it's an initiative to try and promote safety in trailers. It also comes with some security benefits as well. And the fact that we all know through rural crime that um, a lot of tra trailers and farm machinery are are quite uh, prized possessions and quite often get stolen from farmland. A lot of the time criminals will sort of shear off the, the chassis number or serial numbers, but it has been found that they've not uh, got rid of the, uh, the telepass sticker, which is then stored on a database. So it's got full traceability of the trailer. So it's an, you know, that's an extra element to it uh, from a security point of view. But the biggest, the, the, the biggest thing is for, um, to promote safety of the trailer really you know you get brake cables going um brakes not applied properly not set correctly corrosion of the axles of the trailer numerous issues um and i think i'm right in saying that uh even in somerset um police done an operation over exmoor and they found that out of all the trailers that they stopped i think 92 percent were non-compliant meaning they had some form of defect um, and then you're looking at points per, you know, three points per defect technically. Um, so uh, there's a question come into the chat, which it's not a, a free check. Um, it's something that you have to pay for, but it's uh, again, it's about compliance. And, you know, if you're if you're maintaining the safety of your equipment and you're therefore you've got the your work is interest at heart and uh, you're making sure that nothing goes wrong that end. And if you end up in a courtroom because of uh, mechanical failure that or you know due diligence hasn't been done around machinery uh, for the cost of getting your trailer inspected ending up in a courtroom it can lead to millions in payouts compensations if if the worst was to happen so um, I can't give you any specific figures around pricing I'm still learning about it myself but I know it's been a very popular scheme in the southeast and it, we're trying to get this sort of spread across the whole nation is is the ultimate aim. Right, everybody. So, again, moving on from that, uh, Ross from Devon County Council has kindly provided this. Yeah, uh, I, I I don't want to be um, totally doom and gloom, but this is just a, a snapshot of the the Southwest Peninsula. So this is covering Devon and Cornwall, and this is specific. This is data that I can access. So it's it's over the last five years. We only go up to the end of the last calendar year because everything has to be uh, verified or validated um, before it's published. So this is 2018. 22 figures and this is all three severities we go off of slight collisions which can end up with a bump to the head or a sprain or um, cuts and abrasions um, we get the blue the blue um, icon indicates um, serious injury which can be bone breaks it can be uh, fractures deeper lacerations um, neck and back injuries and then obviously I've already alluded to the red the red stars are unfortunately fatalities now these it's a combined data set it's these are all collisions that have either involved an agricultural vehicle or a vehicle tow and a trailer so that could be a pickup and a trailer it could be a car and a trailer but obviously in our rural setting we get the whole uh, remit we get cars attending markets with a small trailer on the back we get the big tractors towing um, the, the larger trailers so this covers it all, but I think just over a five year period, I think most people would agree that that's quite shocking, If especially if you see the, the amount of um, fatalities and serious injury collisions on there. So vehicle maintenance and although it's probably, you know, I know it happens quite a lot where a trailer will sit idle in the yard potentially for maybe 10, 11 months a year and then something will go wrong with something at, at the farm and they'll just pick up the next available trailer, which may not have had, been looked at in years. And it's taken out onto the road and you know if the worst you know it doesn't mean that it's going to be you on the end of it but it could be some innocent person um that's invo involved in a collision and, and therefore comes off worse so um, i know we've had things where where tires have actually just come off of trailers and gone bouncing down the road and caused serious injuries so that's one of the more common common issues with um poor maintenance or the ability to stop when laden because the brake cables gone or the you know 
the the braking um, elements not working on the trailer. So um, yeah, it's just to to highlight that it is a, a live issue and is something that we want to try and prevent if possible. Absolutely. I mean, even as a fire service, so myself, uh, I tow vehicles within the fire service, whether that's operationally, um, for instance, or um, within my road safety role within the fire service. Even, for example, if you haven't got your breakaway cable attached correctly, that's a £50 fine. Even every everything trailer related is really important. I think to make sure it's in good working order. Um, and talking of trailers, tomorrow uh, we will be at Matford Livestock Centre. Uh, and one of the reasons, well, the main reason that we're there is for public engagement. Um, but we will be joined by a special agricultural police officer who specialises in agricultural vehicles and they will be bringing a um, an example trailer down which has got a number of defects on it and most common defects as well. Um, so if you're available tomorrow or if you're already at the, the livestock centre please feel free to come over and say hello to us tomorrow. We, there's a whole range of uh, rural support and uh, businesses and agencies that we take in part. So myself will be there from the fire service. Ross will be there as well. Sorry, James. Yeah, I missed. Did you Sorry, say yeah. about the um, uh, the trailer? Yes, mate. Yeah. So yeah, the working mechanics. Yeah, we've got um, a lot of people there. We've got representatives. Um, from Mason's Kings are going to be there and they're going to talk about the telepath scheme as well because they work in conjunction through the dealership. Um, we've got the rural crime officers coming up from Devon and Cornwall Police. Um, myself, James are going to be there. The Trade and Standards team are also going to be there. Um, and possibly NFU. So I'm just waiting for confirmation of that. So I was just reading another question that came into the chat, which was highlighting that or asking the question that fatalities appear to be on the main roads. Is it usually a vehicle issue or a collision um, without going into everyone um, individually? I couldn't possibly tell you that, but obviously with the 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 main ro roads come enhanced speed generally, um, although the the minor routes are usually subject to national speed limit. Generally speaking, people do adopt a, set, uh, a better level a slower level of driving on these roads whereas if you have a jackknife trailer on the main route where it's you know 60 miles an hour on an open road generally the the severity of injury or fatality is is evident because of because of the speed involved but um that's a good point and um yeah but i can't give you an individual a specific answer should i say um Operation SNAP, I uh, will just touch on this quickly. I, I appreciate, obviously, we're trying to talk to the rural community this evening, and I appreciate you may well see dangerous driving or some form of foolish driving that may be passing you up on double whites, uh, blatantly speeding, someone on their mobile phone, and you're thinking, there's never any police around here in the rural areas, unfortunately, so they like to get away with it. However, Operation SNAP, Operation SNAP is run by the majority of police forces within the country. And Operation SNAP is basically, if you have a dash cam, you can download your own footage and send it into the, into the police force of where the incident's taking place, and they will prosecute on your own footage. Um, Operation Snap is fantastic. So, you know, there you go in full colour HD. You've got the offence and you can prosecute. You can get them prosecuted with your own footage. Um, I think Devon and Cornwall Police and Avon and Somerset Police, especially, they get around 500 clips sent in every month. Um, I don't know if that's going to play. That was meant to be a link, but. I've just popped a link into the chat just in case anyone is interested in this in um, in terms of providing any footage to Devon and Cornwall Police. Um, like I said, you do need um, a dash cam for it, but if you are driving a, you know, an agricultural vehicle or uh, anything that's a tractor with a dash cam, you know, you've got good view of the road. Um, and I guess you are subject to some questionable driving manoeuvres, should we say, if you're travelling at, you know, 
not the desired speed of the car behind and they're likely to try and do something silly with a, an overtake or a dangerous maneuver so um uh, conviction rate is really high on OpSnap now uh, i think i think i'm right in saying it's up to over four and a half thousand submissions um and growing so uh it's becoming very popular like james said there aren't enough pl roads policing units out there to to be everywhere unfortunately and um, there's been a mass massive decline on that but this is kind of fighting uh the 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 war on bad driving really so people are getting convictions off the back of it um absolutely if you look at if you click on operation snap and you type in vision zero southwest into google uh you will see june 2023 a couple of months ago the latest convictions and the latest pushes sent in so um every single one of those on that image on the right is a road within devon and cornwall uh, and what's quite interesting, it shows you the footage and then it plays it again and it shows you the conviction, whether someone was put on a uh, speed awareness course uh, or they were fined or they were given points in their licence. But um, it's very, yeah, it's a very good uh, Operation Snap and it's really uh, undersold, I think. Not many people know about it, um, but dash cams are certainly the way forward. Uh, they're fantastic and, you know, it can be your perfect evidence right there in full HD um, and two things I think are for any for the majority of the clips that are sent into police forces where they are unable to prosecute is normally down to two things one there's not a clear shot of that vehicle's number plate so you need a clear shot of the vehicle's number plate in the footage you also need about a minute either side of the incident to rule out any foul play or anything that has previously happened or anything afterwards where for example they could come back and say well that person cut me up so that's why i did that because they cut me up 30 seconds before that or something like that basically so yeah you need a about a minute either side of the incident and you need a clear shot of that vehicle's number plate but operation snap please uh have a look have a look at the link that ross has put in the chat and if you've got a dash cam it's yeah it's fantastic so moving on again now oh so again the rural community like ross just said there's a there's a decline in uh the roads policing team it's no secret ambulances uh are stretched it's no, that's no secret either unfortunately okay you'll see a lot of them in the news unfortunately part of the outside hospitals aren't there at the minute and stuff like that unfortunately so being in the rural location it can take a lot longer for help to get to you unfortunately uh the bulk of fire services within devon and somerset they are a retained fire station okay so the fire stations within Devon and Somerset the bulk of the stations are retained fire stations the only stations um that's probably about 15 fire stations which are which have firefighters there 24-7 uh but for example I think there's four in Plymouth two in Exeter Paynton Torquay Barnstable those are the only fire stations in the whole of Devon where there's personnel there 24 7 the other ones they are on a retained system so the firefighters that are uh, available they have a fire pager on them um, and if it rings basically they have to have the ability to drop whatever they're doing and get to the fire station within a maximum of five minutes um, that's the golden time to get out the door of the fire of the fire station within the fire engine um, so for the first five minutes if you have an incident and you need the fire service the first five minutes that crew could potentially still be just getting into the fire station the the ambulances they could be really really they may not, they may not even have any ambulances to send they're so busy the police could be coming from a lot further away than what you think they are unfortunately so help can be a lot further away however what can you do to help at a road traffic collision so if you were to come across that incident there and you're driving home or driving somewhere and you saw that we're trying to talk now about about ways ways that you can help okay ways that what can you do so first up like we just said about the emergency services get a nice early call into the emergency services okay um give as much detail as possible okay so when you're trying to give such so much information um how many casualties are in the vehicle how many vehicles are involved um maybe if you can give the 
state the uh, severity of their injuries. That can be the difference from a land ambulance coming and and uh, sending the air ambulance out to you. OK, uh, the air ambulance, Devon Air Ambulance based at Exeter Airport. It can be up and in North Devon within, I think, 16 minutes or around 16 minutes. So I could probably get you quicker than some land ambulances, unfortunately, couldn't it? Let's be totally honest. All right. But yes, providing as much information as possible. Also, fire service, for example, we've got uh, what's called a heavy rescue tender. We've got one that's based in Middlemore that only gets sent out to certain. It doesn't get sent out to all road traffic collisions, but it gets sent out to uh, what sounds like the more severe ones. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the last time I checked it was um, multiple vehicles, a vehicle that's left the carriageway or a vehicle that's a large vehicle, anything, a van or bigger, basically. So that will that will trigger the fire service to send our heavy rescue unit out. Um, absolutely. So try and get that really early call into 999. Get, just, get the relevant emergency services in. Sorry, Ross, go on. So just jumping in, James, um, just prior to that, though, self-preservation is obviously the key thing. You can't save or help anyone else if you can't help yourself. So um, far too often people's intentions are good and they want to, you know, but they haven't actually assessed um the scene and kept themselves safe so the biggest thing is obviously whatever you're driving whether you can make it more visible to uh, other vehicles that may be coming on that stretch of road put your hazards on um try and protect that scene as best as possible and make sure you're out the way of any sort of um potential dangers before trying to save someone else absolutely you know position your vehicle try and fend it off maybe you've got high vis jacket hazard lights on Try and warn other vehicles as well not to come and be a part of that road traffic collision that's already happened. Now, some people may not like blood, okay, may be a bit nervous about approaching the car, but you know, keep yourself safe. You could be the person that's on the phone call to 999, getting the relevant agencies to come and help. You could ask somebody else to go and check on the casualty. If you know, some people may not be like a big fan of blood or whatever, but it's always something that somebody can do to help. At a road traffic collision and calling think, up slowing other vehicles down sorry james but i think it's really vital where we live if you live anywhere remote um and especially you know farming community agricultural up you know out late late hours up first thing in the morning you could be the first first person to come across an incident like that it's happened so, a while ago um and we don't have the resources and we don't have the uh sort of the time response times that we'd like so you know you could be you are major to your communities and uh, you are potentially a massive to what's called a chain of survival um they call the the first hour after a collision the golden hour um so anything you can do to help someone in that time is going to enhance the, the chance of them either um living for starters or having a, a reduced or less severe injury so um yeah it's, it's it's top it's top tips to try and try and help absolutely Go in if they're if they're if they're looking slouched and their and their head and neck is is down on their chest. Pull it, pull their pull their neck up, pull their chin up. Maintain that airway. That could be the the difference. That's literally could be the difference between life and death. Just trying to help hold their head up and maintain that airway. Or if they're in the vehicle but they're physically trapped and they can't get out. Just maybe it may be just putting your hand on their shoulder or or walking over to them and, and talking to them you know, can be really, really, really helpful and, and reassuring to them because they're probably having one of the worst days that they've had. And just that reassurance can, can go a, a heck of a long way. But also being in the rural community, something like What Free Words, the mobile phone app, I'm not too sure if people have heard of that or if you've got it, but What Free Words is a fantastic app that all the different emergency services, we all use What Free Words. I've been to multiple um, operational instances where we've been given a What Free Words location up on the moors and it's been, and it's, been fantastic. So what free words? Um, yeah, will pinpoint you for those that haven't heard of the what the app what free words. It's a mobile phone app that works without internet, and it can pinpoint. It's got the whole world in three meter boxes, um, and in each three meter box are three random words, but they are unique for exactly where you are. And you could to take three large steps somewhere else, those words would change and that'd be and you'd be able to be pinpointed to exactly where you are again, the whole world in three meter boxes. Um, yeah, really, really fantastic. Uh, we recently went to a tractor fire that was 
in a field which was through another field and we were given the what three words location to go straight towards it um yeah fantastic uh it's a really really under undersold app i think i mean that's undersold it's free app but um not a lot of people are aware of it but what three words especially in the rural community can be yeah a game changer to be honest with you anything to add ross well, no, it's, it's a lot of places have uh, different place names to what they show on mapping for the services or they've got a colloquial name or, you know, what locals refer to as a certain w that is perceived to be well known by everyone, but obviously it's not by the services. So what three words just streamlines everything. And, you know, e even if you injure yourself and you've still got access to on, on your farm and you've got access to your phone, if you can send a location, it just it enhances, you know, it can make the difference between getting a quicker response time and getting the services to you to you as quick quickly as possible without trying to trawl through um ordnance survey maps and trying to find where this possibly could be so yeah great invention uh, really popular app and it is definitely playing a major part in saving lives but um that is everything from myself and ross so thank you very much for taking the time to listen to us uh this evening Oh, thank you both. Oh. That's really, really good. And um, yeah, grateful to you taking your time out of your evening. Like it's gradually got darker, James, as you've been it talking. It has, hasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> just see my, just see my teeth lighting yeah, up. Just I can't so really, there we go. see you there, Christian. Yeah. Um, yeah, so basically, I don't know if there's anybody online that has any other questions that haven't been added to the chat um, that might want to, uh, to have a chat. You can obviously unmute yourself if you would rather um, say them out loud or um, as we said before you can put them in the chat or contact us at a later date and we can always put things to Ross and James as uh, myself and Sam are seeing you both tomorrow <laughs> so um, oh I think there might be something coming in oh, uh, so Tilly okay. Pass, yeah really useful to know so thank you yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I can't expand on it I am still getting to uh, know this this campaign myself so every day is a school day um but i know that the work um that's being done around it is is really well received and um said the aim would be to to spread it into the southwest region and get more people involved with it so no that's brilliant i just wanted to know um you know we talked about the cameras right at the beginning um you know about uh, how they can catch you on camera now like if you're on your mobile phone or wherever I just wondered um, obviously I'm assuming it's a lot of in in cities and more kind of major roads but I wasn't sure kind of if it's rolled out um, sort of how far it goes into what size of road do you know what I mean like does it just like major roads or is it a no, road absolutely. Or I, I think it's so Devon and Cornwall Police were trialing it um, and they obviously it's a, it's a it's a mobile van with a huge telescopic pole that goes up and looks down into the vehicles um it will be sighted on um yeah the main routes um but also it'll be sighted on on routes where um there's been a lot of um, complaints shall we say um where there's been uh maybe, maybe people have uh, complained to the police regarding motoring offences it can be positioned in certain certain areas where there's been a high number of um complaints or issues raised from the from the local communities it goes on to um so when we look at vision zero we can look at our high harm routes as well so there's a number of uh routes within the southwest that we class as high harm due to the number of incidents that have happened on those specific roads uh and the cameras will go up there for some time as well um but yeah they can go anywhere I think sites are um, new sites are being so that there's an audit process for any of these camera sites. So there's a procedure alongside that. So there have to be, you know, uh, geographical um, elements to it or a safe area for the camera to be set up, whether that's the main for the setup itself. So the operative that's setting it up or any maintenance issues. So there are there's a bit of criteria around that, but there are more and more locations that the, the cameras can go. Um, obviously, they don't they don't tend to go in locations where they're going to see four cars an hour but it's it, it is um it's where there's greatest need really so but yeah. the the it's been released public figures can be um found online i think if you if anyone wants to put into a google search um ai cameras to for um seat belt and mobile phone use there's quite a lot of news articles around it that've been released to public domain um and the the figures and the 
the actual offence rate is 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 too high. Um, quite shockingly, actually, I think I alluded to seat belts, and we we thought that's one thing that's just become common common practice that everyone wears their seat belt, and there's a really good compliance. And generally, there are. But unfortunately, this technology has unearthed that it could be a slightly a slight rise in issue that you know we're going to have to go back and readdress. Oh, thank you, Ross. That's great. Um, I just had one more question. Um, but it's gone from my brain now. I was. It was. It was. Um, I want to. I'll have a think about it and I'll ask you. Um, at a later date. Has anybody else got anything else they wanted to um to ask? Why we have these gentlemen with us? Oh, I think there might be one more question coming. Oh, I've remembered what I was going to um, ask was, do, you know, you talked about um, like in the rural uh, settings. Has any work been done with like local sort of rural pubs or anything like that? Because I was just thinking, um, obviously, it's quite shocking to see, you know, when you were saying about um, people saying one for the road um, or whatever. I just wondered if um, we'd sort of looked at um, kind of sharing some of those uh, kind of stats with like local village pubs and things. I'm not sure whether it would make any difference, but it might just think twice about them, uh, you know, keeping a bit of an, an idea on people leaving their pub, you know. There is, had... a, so there is a police back scheme um, right. taken on dependent on, I think it's probably the neighbourhood teams that will go around uh, the pubs. I can't remember what the, the scheme's called, it's the bar back scheme and obviously explain to the licensee holders about the consequence of drink driving and the implications and obviously if there's you know perceived issues coming from any uh, specific pub on a regular basis um, and they will also promote um, some pubs will offer not not so many sort of independence in a rural location but a lot of the chain pubs if you're going into the bigger place will actually um, if you're driving, if you're a designated driver, will provide soft drinks for free or give you, you know, little incentives like that. So, um, yeah, I need to. I think the the best people to have on the call for that is the police because they kind of they run that initiative. But um, there are there are works that are done, but I can't give you defined um, answers. But I'm happy to go and find out. Oh, thank you. No, I was just interested because when you were saying about it, I wasn't sure um, if that was something that had been done or was it being explored? No, it's uh, definitely something that we've been trying to do. Um, Christmas 2021, uh, Devon Somerset Fire Service and Devon Cornwall Police, we ran a campaign. Um, obviously, historically, everyone says about the drink drive season being around Christmas time and Christmas parties. Um, statistically nowadays, drink driving is uh, all year round, unfortunately, but uh, 2021 we ran a big campaign around Christmas time um, and had a number of pubs and uh, venues set up that would support the scheme of um, allowing the driver free soft drinks as well. So like Ross said, yeah, offering free soft drinks to the driver, that has been done and that is being done in, in certain pubs. Um, We'll certainly get the information again for that but that's something that we run in at christmas time 2021 so we are doing lots of different there are lots of different initiatives and schemes that are being uh ran with local authorities and um chain um bigger chains of uh pubs and uh local ones as well to be honest with you but i think it varies in certain different areas to be perfectly honest with you, of what's happening and what we've got signed up and stuff really but yeah there is a lot of work that is, is being done with the with uh public houses for sure yeah i think i am um, sort of just going on to i know we we say it's not it's all year round but i think the last uh drink drive campaign in the december around the christmas campaign brought back um over 200 arrests for drink driving so it's drink and drug driving so it's still something that's that's still there despite all the campaigns or the messaging it's still people will take the chance um but we're just trying to highlight that you know if you do get caught it's the ripple effect and you know your dependents your children your social life your you know whatever the the, the spiral or the ripple effects are, are so great that from one moment of carelessness or just for that extra drink or that one drink at all can just um, change your life. Excellent. Thank you both very much. I really appreciate you taking your time to speak with us this evening and sharing all the 
uh, information that you have done. Um, and also it will be great tomorrow, I think, uh, having an agricultural engagement day down at um, Exeter Market with all the different agencies and just sort of trying to get the the word out there and kind of trying to engage with the rural community because I know a lot of us uh, agencies do that that's where it is kind can be quite tricky uh, kind of getting in in with the farmers and uh, you know getting to communicate with them when they're so busy and you know at far on the out on the farm so that that'll be interesting to see what what happens tomorrow really yeah really looking forward to it um it'll be a new experience for me like i said um in this role it's uh it's a first for me so i'm looking forward to trying to build some relationships and just spread the awareness really so it's um yeah we're not out there to sort of target anyone or or, or um oh, i can't think of the word now i've lost my train of thought but yeah we're not we're not there to sort of have a go at anyone we just want to spread the awareness and, and if we can make it a, a small difference to just a couple of people that would be a really good uh, good success to start with it's all Preach. about engagement so come and say Preach hello, was please. the word sorry Preach was the word. <laughs> okay, I, I, momentarily it just went from me um, and I must apologize we had a few tech issues so our uh, presentation wasn't quite as fluid as we'd like to have been but um, we've got through it and hopefully people have taken something from it anyway Definitely. Um, and we were, I just need to make apologies for our next speaker, who was Stephanie from the Farm Safety Foundation. Um, unfortunately, she can't, uh, she couldn't make it this evening, but she has booked in on our February uh, webinar. So um, the the one that's being held on the first Thursday of February. So um, yeah, that that's a good one. So we hopefully will advertise that she'll be speaking on uh, at that event instead. Um, Sam, did did you want to move on to the next slide? I think we're just going to take the opportunity for Luke just to say a few things about the Fire Future Farm Resilience Programme. Um, it's always a good opportunity whenever we can to kind of mention about it, uh, what the most up to date information is. And um, yeah, if I can hand over to you, Luke. Awesome. Thank you for having me. So a series of webinars that we're putting on for you these will be in webinars being funded through the Switch Farming Resilience Programme. So in four words, it's free farm business support. Some of you attending may be familiar, haven't already attended a workshop. Some of you may have not. But um, if you are, if you're not familiar with the programme, this is to support you with the um, changes taking place with funding for farmers. So if you are in receipt of single payments and you've noticed your most recent one, you've taken a bit of a hit. There's different funding opportunities that are coming in to replace single payments in the form of the Environmental Land Management Scheme. So there's the Sustainable Farming Incentive you might be aware of. There's Countryside Stewardship Plus, which was originally the Local Nature Recovery. And then there's also Landscape Recovery. So freeze street, these three streams of funding are all available to those are in receipt of single payments and as well as your know, new entry into the industry uh defra is encouraging farmers to sign up to for his new funding streams so if this sounds of any interest to you at all do get in touch we um as well as these well-being webinars we run a series of workshops exploring what's taking place currently in the world of funding for farmers as well as these special work, specialist workshops where we can explore succession planning or woodlands, uh, soil management. If it's something you want to talk about, it's very likely we're going to be able to provide support for you in the form of a webinar. We can also provide free one-to-one -one support. So farm business advisors from the companies listed in the bottom right hand corner of that slide there, Somerset Business Agency, Farm and Wildlife and Advisory Group, Creedy Associates, Diverse Regeneration Company and North Devon Plus, as well as Business Information Point who lead on the project, all providing farm business advisors across Cornwall, Devon, Dorset and Somerset to um, offer available free of charge to come out to farm and to talk to you about making the changes for your farming business if you are receiving single payments to help you develop develop your farm business for to become resilient ahead of the future changes that are coming so it's really important especially right now with the cost of living energy crisis going up the price for most goods going up 
it's um it's a really important time to be considering what your options are for the farm business so if you are interested um do get in touch with us otherwise if you'd like to know more again get in touch via all the details are on that slide that's an example of one of our flyers that we've got which we duplicated it and put it onto the slide for tonight so yeah if anything that i've just mentioned about the program is of interest to do please get in touch amazing thanks ever so much luke i think it'll be good to um yeah to get take any opportunity possible to raise awareness of what the program's there for and what it can offer really um okay if we can move on to the next slide please sam um i just wanted to add this slide as well um onto our webinars because i think it's just very important with the topical issue you know all the different topics that we cover um you know talking about roadside you know road accidents um things that we've just been focusing on this evening um but also other topics that we're going to um be discussing over the coming months um i think we'll just try and share this slide um at the end of the of the webinar each time just to uh for people so that they can see and um, what support services are available and um and how to contact them um obviously since we've been doing the rural support and well-being project we've bought built up um a further network of uh support services we've realized just how much support is available to uh the farming community to the rural community and to people in general and um so we just are so wanting to use it at any opportunity as a platform for these support services to be made aware of and for uh, even just one person can access help through one of these channels um, if they're struggling if they need financial physical mental support um, I know that uh, you know they're they're there and we always think that we don't ever want to call on them or we wouldn't need them it's not for us but you never know when it might be that just that one phone call might be just what you need to do and it it could be uh the way to to sort saving a life or to um supporting yourself in one way or another so i think we'll just share this slide each time so it's in in the recording and um and people know where to access it and and receive those phone numbers those vital make that vital call if they need to um, and I think that will be the end of our webinar today. Is there anything uh, that anyone else would like to um, to add before we leave? This is the uh, business information point uh, contact details. We've got the webinar, um, sorry, we've got the email address there and the contact telephone number. Um, so the listing here is of all the <coughs> other uh, webinars that we have planned for the coming Thursdays. So it's the first Thursday of every month up until April. Um, so also, if anyone has any other topics that they they think we should cover or any ideas for speakers over the coming uh, webinars, please get in touch with us and um, we would love to <coughs> have you come and speak with us or, uh, you know, try and contact somebody that could cover a topic that you think would be really beneficial to the farming and rural community. OK, thanks very much, everyone.